I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. For a free month's trial of Treehouse, head on over to teamtreehouse.com slash show. In this episode, we'll be talking about DPI, responsive charts, media queries, and more. Let's check it out. First up is the designer's guide to DPI. What does that mean? Well, DPI is dots per inch, and it's an important topic that designers have been talking about quite a lot because these days you can't rely on every single screen having the same pixel density, the same amount of pixels packed into the same area. It tends to vary. For example, we have uh, retina iPhones and iPads now, and even retina displays on computers like these ones. And they're only going to get more dense. They are, at least that's the rumor or the speculation. So this is a really good time to start learning about DPI and what it means to you as a designer or a developer uh, if you haven't done so already. This is a fairly basic guide, but it's good that it's basic because DPI can be somewhat confusing if you're new to it. So there's an explanation about what is DPI and what is PPI or pixels per inch and goes in depth there with some really great illustrations. Then it goes on to say what the impact on your design might be. So basically anything that is at a higher pixel density is going to appear smaller on the screen or physically smaller, at least in general as sort of a general rule. There's a more detailed explanation there. There is a difference between the screen resolution and what the screen's actual native resolution is. And then it also talks about what's 4K, what are monitor hertz, what's a retina display, and so on. Basically everything that you might need to know as a designer. So this is a, a really great in-depth article about all of these newer screens and kind of what they mean for uh, design. But anyway, great article. Be sure to check that one out. Yeah, also good, you know, if you're a designer, send it to some developers so you guys can establish a common ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Put, put the we in DPI, not make it so one-sided. Yeah, maybe, maybe someday we'll form an understanding. Next up, we have a project called Chartist.js. As you might expect from the name, this is a JavaScript library for charts. Uh, but the spin on it is that they are responsive. And look at this little guy with a top hat and pitchfork pointing at the chart. And you can also see this chart even supports CSS animations. Look at that. What wow. What is happening? I know. Wow. So uh, very, very easy to use. Uh, they're also customizable. A few different kinds of charts are supported. We've got line charts, bar charts, pie charts. Oh, I'm kind of hungry now talking about pie charts. Yeah. Any hamburger menus on this site? I you know I, I how much so. of that pie chart is a pie chart? How much? 100% of it. Yeah, the whole thing. I'm pretty hungry. The whole thing's a pie. Now that you said that. Yeah. Uh, so here is a CSS animation example. Look at that. We, the, I don't know exactly what this is what this is doing, but these these results are absolutely insane and not typical for what the chart usually should display. Wow! So you should have a very strong emotional reaction to what's going on here, and uh, I, I mean with the chart, not with uh, the tension between Nick and myself. But it is responsive. So let's see what happens when I resize the browser. What? This chart is getting smaller. Oh, look at that different chart. No, it didn't. It didn't change. It's at a different spot on the page. It had to move when the browser moved. Okay, anyway. So any CSS3 animations uh, are supported. And actually, we can look at the API documentation. No, that's not what I want. I want the examples, live coding. Uh, you can actually edit the examples on the site, which is pretty awesome. So here are the different labels. Like So for example, instead of Monday, we'll change that to Nick Day. And you can see that changes right there. And then we can mess around with the numbers, and the uh, changes are directly reflected on the chart right there. So you can see this is really, really simple to use. You just give it some data, and then call Chartist and the kind of chart that you want to use. Uh, here's a pie chart example, and we can just say Chartist.pi. 
instead of a line chart, we're using a pie chart here. Anyway, very, very easy to use. Uh, we'll have a link to this in the show notes, which you can check out at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us in iTunes. We are the Treehouse Show. And don't forget to join us for a free month trial at teamtreehouse.com slash show. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is this wonderful blog post from Brad Frost. That was really difficult to say for some reason. Uh, it's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Media Queries. Of course, uh, I think that's a play on the title of the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I think is the title of the book. Think, and you're thinking of Twilight. I think you're right. I think, I think Twilight is actually what I was thinking of there. Uh, anyway, this blog post is a little older, but it's still perfectly good. Uh, let's go down and look at some of these seven habits. First one I want to point out is let the content determine the breakpoints. And I think this is really great advice that Brad Frost is giving here. He says, every time you see 320 pixels, 480 pixels, and so on used as breakpoint values, a kitten get its head bitten off by an angel or something like that. Wow, that sounds really horrible. So don't do that. Uh, you should use uh, breakpoints that are basically based on the content of the page because these preset breakpoints are just based on popular devices. So, for example, 320 is an iPhone and portrait, 480 is an iPhone and landscape, 768 is an iPad in portrait, and so on. Because these actual dimensions could be irrelevant. Uh, in you know a week's time or a year's time or something like that. New devices come out all the time, so it's much better to tailor your content to the breakpoints and not the other way around. Or, or I should say it's better to tailor your breakpoints to the content. Excuse me. Um, it's not a good idea to use these preset ones just because they could change. They, they may not mean anything in uh, a year's time or something like that. Also, also, media queries sparkle in the daylight. That is something that I think you just made up. You should treat layout as an enhancement. So, for example, if you're building a mobile-first responsive site, which you probably should be doing in this day and age, you want to make sure that layout is just sort of treated as an enhancement. So, you build your very simple mobile first styles for the win and it says that right here and you can then enhance that with layout later on so when you go up to these larger uh, desktop styles you can start to add layout uh, last thing I'm gonna point out here there's a couple more you should check out but last thing I'm gonna point out is the idea of using major and minor breakpoints so for example you might have a website that has a single column layout on mobile and then expands into maybe two or three columns on larger uh, desktop devices or perhaps tablets. Those types of dramatic changes do need a breakpoint, but you can also have smaller breakpoints in between if you just want to change small parts of the site, such as a, a font size or maybe the navigation might switch from horizontal to vertical and so on. And you can do smaller breakpoints in these sort of minor breakpoints, as uh, Brad Frost points out here, instead of doing dramatic changes and trying to squeeze those minor changes into the more dramatic breakpoints. Anyway, really good article. Uh, be sure to check this one out. Very nice. Next up, we have a project called Victor.js. This is a JavaScript 2D vector maths library for Node.js and the browser. I know that because it says it in the header of this web page. Uh, one thing I'm just going to point out that is of little to no relevance to what we're talking about is that you can click anywhere on this page right here, and that little thing will follow to the points that you just clicked on. I think that's really the most important thing here. If you take one thing away from the Treehouse Show, it is, um, well, it's not this particular thing. Uh, I, think, I think it'll be a, a deep sense of sadness and regret. Anyway, this is very, very easy to use. You uh, simply install it using node.js or the browser. Uh, it's very easy to use with Bower. And then you can create new uh, vector 
uh, I'm sorry, new X and Y coordinates with Victor. So uh, why would you use this library instead of just creating your own JavaScript object for it? Well, you get all sorts of maths that go along with it. So you create your point, and then you can go through and add to the point. You can have all this math done for you. Uh, you can, for example, right here, create a new vector and then add to the x coordinate another vector coordinate and then call it to string. You'll get these particular values. Now, you don't need to call it to string. You can have all that math done for you right there. Now, this also works not just with addition, but you can do rotation. Uh, you can do all sorts of different math calculations. Uh, and this is very easy to use. The documentation is also very thorough, so make sure to check that out. We will have a link in the show notes. Very nice. I like the fact that it's called Victor because there's probably other JavaScript objects that might be a, a vector and could conflict with the names. So it's pretty clever, and it's, it's nice that they called it Victor just so you can sort of remember that it is actually a vector. You could say it's the winning name for the library. It is. Is the victor. Next up is an article called Pure CSS Parallax Scrolling Websites. Of course, parallax scrolling websites have been popular for quite some time now. That's basically where a website might have multiple layers of depth or at least the appearance of such. And like an onion. Right. Or like our relationship. And when you scroll down the page, there's sort of multiple components that parallax with one another or move at different speeds. This is sort of like when you're riding in a car or a train and you look at something that's close to you and it moves by very quickly, while something that's far away moves by much more slowly, or at least it has the perception of doing that because of perspective. Like our time together. Indeed. But parallax is typically handled with JavaScript, and that's actually not very performant. It's listening uh, to the scroll event, and it does a couple of things once a scroll happens, and it triggers lots of reflows and repaints, and that's just not good for performance. It typically ends up with lower frame rates than what might be desirable. So are you saying that it can be done in pure CSS? That is exactly what this article describes how to do. Now, there's a bunch of theory here, but that's boring. Let's go ahead and jump into a demo. I'm going to do this in Safari because, actually, I'll switch back to the article here. It points out that this technique is broken in Chrome 37, and at the time of this recording, I am indeed using Chrome 37 here, so I have to switch to a different browser. But here's what the demo looks like. You can scroll down the page, and it's parallaxing all of this with pure CSS. Now, wow. how the heck are they doing that? Because it's not using any kind of uh, JavaScript event to listen to the scroll. So how are, are they able to get these layers to scroll? Well, Magic. if you click on this debug mode, what? It will show you exactly what's actually going on here. Wow. Basically, they are placing these elements onto different planes and then translating them using the transform property. So it's moving these different layers into uh, the Z plane or the depth of the page. And then when you actually look at it straight on, you're looking at it. Uh, from straight on here, it looks like some layers are moving slower and some layers are moving faster, and you get that nice parallax effect. Anyway, this article goes into a lot more depth as to how this particular effect is achieved. Highly recommend you check it out. And I think that's all we have time for. Well, that is. Who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything that we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us on iTunes. We are The Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile, business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com slash show and get a month free. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.